I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and look with me in Isaiah chapter 6. My text today is from verse 1 down to verse 5, and I want to speak with you about the Lord upon his throne. Anybody that does not know a God that reigns, but I would even add one who reigns through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, does not know the Lord. You can know for certainty that any that deny the Lord Jesus Christ and God's sovereignty in him have never been taught of him. And this particular portion here in Isaiah chapter six is special to me because it is the portion that the Lord used many years ago, back in 1984, actually, while I was in Africa. I had been sent out by a congregation in Michigan to preach. And at that particular time in my life, I had embraced Calvinism and felt that every scripture, every time I preached, I had to somehow preach one of the five points of Calvinism or all of them in order for it to be the truth. And one morning early, we didn't have electricity at that particular time, I lived in a little village back in the woods where I was working and actually had a kerosene lamp. And I was sitting at my desk, it was very hot and muggy, and the Lord directed me to listen to a message that someone had sent me by a preacher that was preaching from Isaiah 6. And I can't tell you anything about what the preacher had to say, but I do know and can tell you today what the Lord had to say, because as he preached from this portion of scripture, Isaiah 6, my eyes were opened. The Lord was pleased to open my eyes. And this testimony of Isaiah that we have here is exactly how it was that the Lord dealt with this poor sinner. And I'm thankful. And I wanna speak to you from this portion today about the Lord upon his throne because I could not know him and would never have known him. He could have left me in that particular state that I was in thinking that I had some knowledge, but it was just intellectual. It was logical, it was theological. And some would say, well, at least it was the truth. No, it wasn't the truth without Christ. And so we see here, in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah says, in the year that Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Therefore, the title, the Lord upon his throne. High lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings with twain, he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that word glory means weight. Ah, uh, if you've ever, by God's grace, had your eyes open to see God in all his glory, and we could not see him apart from his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, what a weight of glory that is. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me. That's what I cried that day when the Lord first opened my eyes. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell 
in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen who the king, not some little wannabe Jesus, sitting up in heaven, wringing his hands and hoping that somehow someone will believe on him. No, mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. That word host means everything that you can envision, whether it's the universe, the stars, and all of their constellations, galaxies, angels, armies, whatever it be, the Lord of hosts, whether in heaven or on earth, then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Well, here, as I was reading this particular portion of scripture, and I had read it for a number of years, it wasn't a portion that was foreign to me, but unless the Lord opens your eyes, you're not going to see what's clearly set forth here. It begins here within the year that Uzziah died. And this struck me because I had never really considered what had taken place in the year that Uzziah died. And this is why it's important to compare scripture with scripture. And so for that, we have to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, where I would invite you to look with me, because here in Chronicles, we have the story recorded in God's word here of Uzziah the king. And when you read about Uzziah, there was much about him that was to be admired. And I want us to read this here because Uzziah would have been one of those that was considered to be a good king. And Isaiah was God's prophet during the reign of Uzziah. In fact, that's how Isaiah chapter one begins in verse one. He says, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah. But then it goes beyond Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So the Lord gave Isaiah a very long ministry over 40 years. And yet, even as the Lord said to Isaiah that he would raise him up to preach, but the people in hearing were not here. And yet the Lord caused him to be faithful in declaring the Lord Jesus Christ in his day. We know how the Lord was pleased to use Isaiah in those writings, particularly with the Ethiopian eunuch many years later. We don't know how the Lord would be pleased to use his word. I would never have known that it would have been this very word given through Isaiah, even though in Isaiah's day, there were not many, if any, that the Lord converted their hearts. And yet here was this poor sinner sitting out there in Africa, isolated from much of the world, and back in some forest town village, and yet the Lord was pleased to bring his word home to my heart. But this was the portion that the Lord used to cause me to see not only that he is the Lord upon the throne, but even as the seraphim cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We see that exemplified here with Uzziah. In 2 Chronicles 26, then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. And he built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. But 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name 
also was Jequila of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. You see, this is where I could identify with Uzziah because I had been raised in a home where at least the scriptures were read and taught. And I was in a frame of mind, just like Uzziah, desirous, according to what light I had at that particular time, at least to serve the Lord. And that's why I was sitting out there in the middle of Africa. But here, Uzziah was a king, it says, who did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, at least externally, in establishing what would be necessary for true worship. And the Lord made him prosper. In fact, God helped him in battle, as you read on there in verses six through eight, he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jamie and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. Everything he was doing was for the protection of that people of Judah. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gerbal and the Mahuit means and the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. So here was one that God purposed should be a great leader. And his name was known far and wide. You say, well, what happened in the year that Uzziah died? And we're not going to read this entire portion here, but look at verse 16. See, this is what struck me and the Lord brought home to my heart, being lifted up in pride, thinking myself somewhat when I was nothing. When he was strong, what uh, some might say at his pinnacle of his success, notice his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Is it possible that the Lord cause a man to succeed and prosper in many ways that men look upon as being good and right, and yet the heart be lifted up to their destruction? Absolutely. Here's an example. For he transgressed against the Lord his God. And what was his transgression? He went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. You say, well, what's wrong with that? At least his intention was good, but this was a serious and fatal mistake which led to his death. When he was strong, when he was mighty, he was proud of his accomplishments and even feet free from the fear of the enemy, but his heart was so overcome by his importance that he actually went into that temple, into the holy place where the altar of incense stood and into which none but the priest could enter and went and offered incense upon the altar. Well, let's see what happened. It says Azariah the priest went in after him and with him four score priests of the Lord, that's 80 priests that surrounded him that were valiant men there to protect the temple and the altar and uh, the glory of God. And it says, they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, it pertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. See, this is where the Lord struck that arrow to my own heart because with everything I knew, yet in my presumption, I was, yes, I had some knowledge of the importance 
of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and its significance. And yet in my approach before the throne of God, it wasn't exclusively through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was in that lost state of heart and mind where I considered that it was part Christ's work and part mine. And I was zealous about bringing before God those things that I felt were good accomplishments. Oh, what pride. And uh, even as here, Azariah the priest, the 80 priests of the Lord withstood King Uzziah, telling him the seriousness of this act. A lot of people don't, even though they say they worship God, but they don't worship him in the exclusivity of coming before God in no other way than through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest. And that acceptance can only be through Christ's work. Otherwise, we have nothing but sin and sinfulness. Only the priests of God and the sons of Aaron were consecrated by God to burn incense to the Lord. And by fulfillment, only the Lord Jesus Christ consecrated and set apart as God's high priest, God's lamb, was qualified to offer himself, not sacrifices, but the sacrifice of himself unto his father. And here these priests told him that such an act could not honor him before God. Any thought of coming through the works of your own hands. See, I was at that particular time under the persuasion, and it was a delusion, that somehow, since I had made my profession, and through my endeavors, and my dedication, my devotion, and I was serious about it, that I was improving my state before God. It's what you read in some of the writings called progressive sanctification, where some think that Indeed, as time goes on and as they, in their zeal and devotion before God, they get in a state of sinning less and less. Oh, what a delusion. And yet, that's where I was. And I had to be brought to see that, no, apart from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I had to be brought to see as Isaiah cried out, woe is me, I am undone that there's nothing in this flesh that is ever improved, that apart from the work of Christ and his sanctifying himself there at the cross and his work on behalf of those sinners the Father gave him, there's no hope. But here, these priests surrounded him and told him that such an act was not an honor, but a dishonor to God. When you want to get people upset today, even in our generation, tell them, let them know plainly that any thought of having anything to offer to God apart from coming through the singular, solitary work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no sanctification. There is no justification before God. Doesn't matter how sincere they are. I'm sure here that Uzziah was sincere. And yet what a folly it was to violate the very holiness of God. And so we read here in verse 19, rather than bow, see this tells me right here that even though he had all this success and the hand of the Lord was upon him for his accomplishments, yet no grace. Because here it says Uzziah was wroth. He was angry, just like Cain was angry with God, that God would not accept the works of his hands. I actually had a lady years ago shout me down after a meeting saying, you mean to tell me that all these years that I've served the Lord in teaching Sunday school don't amount for anything? And I said, well, they amount for something. They amount for dumb, that's all. But Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. 
And while he was wroth with the priests, see, to be wroth with the priests here, again, shows no grace. There was no grace of God in him. Whatever knowledge he had had to that point, it was for his destruction because to be wroth with the priests is to be wroth with that God-appointed intermediary, the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. What leprosy represents is sin, the vileness of who he was in spite of what he thought of himself. It came out as the Lord struck him with leprosy. And Azariah, the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yep. Thrusting out is a picture of what it is to stand before a holy God and not have the righteousness of God imputed to your account through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that thrusting out, being cast out, like that man that showed up when the king purposed to honor his son and didn't have the wedding garment. I'm sure he was well dressed, but the instruction was to cast him out into darkness forever. They thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out. <laughs> Even he, to such a point, realized he needed to get out. And it says, because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house being a leper. Couldn't even dwell in the palace, set a several house, separated out, for he was cut off, not just from his relations, but look at here, cut off from the house of the Lord. Who's the house of the Lord other than those that the Lord has chosen in his grace and for whom Christ would come and pay the sin debt. And uh, that temple representing all the perfections and attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a strong word of condemnation. Cut off! And Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people and the land. And so, instead of listening to the priests, because he didn't have an ear to hear, like so many today, will not hear this word, even though it's plainly set forth. He became angry and held to that censer with a death grip, that censer to burn incense, like so many today, hold to the thought that somehow they can still come of their own supposed free will. But it's a death grip, like rigor mortis setting in. The last thing that a person will let go of is their self-will and their self-works, thinking it's somewhat before God. And so God smote him with that leprosy. And when they buried him, they said, he is a leper. That, and coming back now to Isaiah chapter 6, is what Isaiah learned and saw. Because Isaiah was a good friend of Uzziah the king. And they had spent much time together over all those years that he was a king from his age 16 to 52. But when Isaiah here in Isaiah chapter 6 had heard and learned of Isaiah's death, because that's what he mentions here, in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. When he said, I saw also, what he's saying is the difference, because Uzziah saw the Lord upon the throne in his condemnation and his wrath and being struck with that leprosy. But here, when Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, who did he see? What was the vision that he had here of the Lord? Well, if you go over to John chapter 12, in verse 41, it's very clear 
that Isaiah saw none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Christ had not yet come to this earth. And yet, as you study the Old Testament, you see that there were times in which the Lord Jesus Christ made appearances. And that here was one of those examples where to see the Lord upon his throne, none can see him and live except it be through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 12, again, speaking of those in the days of Isaiah, you can see in verse 40, John writes of this. Let's go back to verse 37, because the unbelief in the days of Christ when he came to this earth is compared to that of Isaiah's day. It says in verse 37, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. There was physical evidence that this Jesus of Nazareth was none other than that Messiah who was to come, the Son of God, and yet they believed not on him. People say, well, the Lord Jesus could just come back today and walk on this earth. Then people would believe. No, they, would, they didn't believe on him when he was here in the first place because they were blind according to what the Lord had purposed. John 12, 38 says that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? He's quoting here from Isaiah 53. And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Again, as Isaiah preached, he didn't see the Lord turning hearts, but it was according to God's purpose. We can complain all we want to about the blindness that we see even in our generation, but God is not obligated to open sinners' eyes. People get concerned whenever you talk about God condemning sinners. What ought to surprise us is that he saves any. And even more so that he said, save a wretch like me. But it says here in verse 39, therefore they could not believe. There are none that are going to believe apart from God having purpose in his grace that they should believe. Because that Isaiah said again, he hath, he hath blinded their eyes. Note it. Who blinded their eyes? God. I believe that that's where many misquote and misrepresent that uh, portion of scripture when Paul was writing to the Corinthians there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it may be because our translators or the editors of this particular portion of scripture in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, they put the name for God in little G-O-D. But I will tell you that when you go back to the Greek and look at it, that's none other than the name of God, the sovereign God, spoken of in verse 2, whereby it's by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, capital G-O-D. Should be the same down here in verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. You know how that connects over here with John 12? Therefore they could not believe because he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. That's what made the difference between Uzziah and Isaiah. Uzziah's blinded by God. And therefore he was justly condemned, even though God prospered him. Like so many today, like dead men walking. You look at their lives and their successes, and you think from a worldly and earthly standpoint how great men they are. No, they're not. Not if they haven't had Christ revealed to them. But here, God judicially has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Unless God gives you eyes to see, you'll never see. Those that follow after miracles today, as Paul wrote to Thessalonians, they're God has caused them to believe a lie that they should not be converted and know the truth. And here again, it's clear. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. 
that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and what I should heal them. There are those that God, some people say, well, in his permissive will, he just lets people go to their own condemnation. No. Those that are condemned are ordained to that condemnation. Paul writes of it there in Romans 9, the vessels of wrath. They're vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. And this is what Isaiah understood. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Who did he see? Notice here in verse 41, these things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Who's the his there? Who's the him? Well, it's none other, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the object here of these Pharisees' unbelief. And yet Isaiah, when he saw his glory, the glory is of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. That's who John is writing about. He spake of him. And that's what struck Isaiah. Why it was that Uzziah should so be judged by God and his sovereignty, and yet Isaiah himself be spared. And it says here that he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. I have had different people say to me, well, do you really have to believe God is sovereign in order to be saved? I'll tell you this, when God opens your eyes, you see a sovereign Lord God. There's none that he has saved and drawn by his spirit, but what they have seen and bowed to him, even as Isaiah here, as the sovereign Lord. He says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne not some wannabe Jesus that brings fuzzy feelings when people talk about their experience, no. But a holy Lord God, it says here, who's trained. In other words, the word there is the very borders of his judicial robes. Think of a Supreme Court judge putting on that robe and sitting down. But this spread throughout the entire temple. And not only that, but verse 2, the seraphims, these are the angels or the ministers, those that are the messengers of the Lord that are bright and glorious. And they're fervent in their zeal for God's service and glory, night and day. These are angels that never fell. And yet in that preserved state, even they, it says, covered their faces with their wings because of the reverence, even down to their feet, owning their own imperfections in, in the light of God's holiness. Even they acknowledge that it is not to be compared to his holiness. And what was their cry down there in verse three? It wasn't love, love, love. Notice the word love is not even mentioned here. This was not Isaiah's concern at this point of knowing whether or not he was loved of God or not. There's some that that's their stumbling stone. Well, I, I need to know whether the Lord loves me or not. I'll tell you what, he cannot love any apart from the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves his son and he loves that righteousness that his son came and earned and established and God there and then at the cross, imputed, put to the spiritual account of everyone for whom he died, Isaiah included. See, that's where Isaiah's eyes were looking, to this one who would come and fulfill all things according to what was there already in type and picture and prophecy in the Old Testament. But of how holy he is, God is infinitely and eternally and immutably holy in all his ways. As I read that, I was struck with just how much of a sinner I, I am, and I was. And it's repeated, I believe, three times. Holy, 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 because God is the thrice holy God. Here we see the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. And in each 
person of that Godhead. There's one God, but three persons, Father and Son and Spirit, yet they all are one. That one attribute that is mentioned here is actually the word that is more frequently mentioned and emphasized with regard to the nature of God than any other attribute. If you look over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'll tell you, this is what I believe when the Spirit of God opens eyes to see. It's going to be to see this very Holy One, the Holy God, apart from the work of Christ. We deserve nothing but condemnation. Here in 1 Timothy 6, 15, Paul says, which in his times he shall show, and there it's speaking of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ in the end, who is the blessed and holy potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only, this I know it was, this is who Isaiah saw, I lifted up upon his throne, the Lord Jesus Christ, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto you, whom no man has seen, or can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. These folk that give their little testimonies of having had some dream or vision of Jesus, and it was a warm glow, fuzzy feel. They, they've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a delusion. And so we see what Isaiah's response was here in verse 5. There's so much here, but notice he said, woe is me. I am undone. Literally, he saw himself at that time as, un as cut off from God. He said, well, the Lord had already raised him up and called him to be a prophet. Yes, but I will tell you that this is not a one and done. As we come to the scriptures and we consider, again, the holiness of God, even now my heart cries out, how can it be that the Lord should have anything to do with me, the sinner? I am an unclean branch of an unclean tree that is in myself apart from being grafted into that tree of life, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, I have nothing. I am a man that dwells in the midst of a people of unclean lips, but notice it says, I'm, I am myself a man of unclean lips. There's no looking out of yourself to others and think, well, at least I'm not as bad as that one. Oh, that you would know yourself. The half has not been told. I am that great sinner and especially even manifest by my lips which reveal the heart how the heart the mouth speaks so even our words even though many times we might give praise and glory to God yet we know it comes from an unclean heart and so there is no hope for any especially me before God's awful and holy presence. And that's why in the remainder there we see the solution, the remedy for Isaiah. The seraphim taking a live coal in his hand which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. What was that altar? It was a burnt offering that had been sacrificed unto the Lord and he put that on his mouth figuratively speaking here saying lo this has touched thy lips and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged. That's the only way that iniquity can be taken away and sin purged. It's only through what this sacrifice represented the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what did Isaiah learn? What did he see? Just to sum this up, well, first of all, God is holy. And how infinitely holy he is in all his ways, his acts, and his nature. We know that he will in no wise clear the guilt, nor can he receive any sinner apart from perfect holiness. That's why it's not in us. Where is that to be found? It's only in the righteousness 
that the Lord Jesus Christ came and earned and established. And God approved. God accepted. There's only one righteous one that God has ever accepted. And that's the work of his son as the God man. And therefore, as the high priest bearing the names of those people that he represented, that's who Christ now represents before his father, those that the father has given. God's holiness. But oh, our sinfulness. That too, Isaiah learned. And we continue to learn. You never can say, well, that's what I was. I was a sinner. No, Paul wrote, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He didn't say of whom I was chief, but I am chief. It's like that one preacher of old that uh, when he died, he desired to have put on his tombstone. I am a great sinner. I have a great savior. That's a certainly a testament of faith. And uh, may the Lord indeed be pleased not to leave us to ourselves as he did with Uzziah but that when we come, we come in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ alone, because there alone is the sinner's acceptance. Amen.